Thank you, Bo. At the, uh, I serve on the team board of board, and the meeting today, the board meeting, was announced that we have 462 folks registered for this team board meeting, which makes it the largest in the 20 year history of team board. So part of that reason, Bo, is the quality of programming, and I want to thank you uh, and this panel. And you're going to see this year more and more folks from other states coming to Team Florida and presenting. We have one of those today, Carrie Witt. Uh, Carrie Witt uh, ran the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco for uh, the bridge 27 years, ran it for uh, bridge operations for 18 years. He's a past president of the IBTTA and uh, he entered the private sector last year. He, all things bridge operations, Carrie knows about. And, um, the Golden Gate is, uh, I read the other day, it's been featured in more disaster movies here than any other bridge in, in the world. So if you're concerned about Godzilla or the zombies attacking your uh, your infrastructure, Carrie is the person. So Carrie was going to make this very, very brief presentation last October. He called me and said, you know, Jim, the fires are like one mile from my house. Can I wait until January? I said, sure, Carrie, you know, I'll take care of business back home. So he's here for two reasons, give you a very, very brief update on California, and secondly, take what he's learning from Team Florida, so this is his first Team Florida be back to California to create a Team California. So, Carrie, one thing you'll know about Team Florida, we like our receptions for Team Florida, <laughs> and uh, I think this is scheduled to end at five, so you have just a few minutes to make the presentation. No, take your time. Take your time. Oh All right, well. Listen, I am acutely aware, and even more so now, that uh, I am what is standing between you and your, uh, and your reception. But uh, thank you for inviting me back to come and, and, and uh, talk to you. So I'm a little bit out of sync, because this is a presentation that I actually put together for October, and I you know, thank you for, uh, for inviting me back. And, and, uh, um, so I'm not going to talk about automated connected vehicles. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And when I was first invited uh, back in November, they said, come and tell us you know, you've got the Silicon Valley and all this stuff in California. Come and tell us all this gee whiz stuff that's happening in California that you're seeing that's eventually going to end up here in Florida. And we in California have this kind of arrogant view that all innovation starts in California and comes east. <laughs> And what I can tell you is, from personal experience, getting familiar with a couple of projects here in Florida, that that's just absolutely not true. It is true that a lot of the underlying technology work is done in California uh, by some of our technology company, companies, Google, et cetera. Um, but the practical application of those is actually being, being led really by Florida and a few other states. But uh, I just want to say that the last thing that I want to do is to come to Florida and try to out G whiz the Floridians. So I'm not going to try to do that. Um, the, the cover slide that I showed you just a minute ago is, a, is an outtake from a larger photo that came from a news helicopter. This is uh, the Wednesday evening before Thanksgiving this year. And this is the I-405, it's the freeway through the LA Basin. And uh, I can tell you that, unfortunately, this is not all that unusual. This picture would be very much the same on a lot of Thursday and Friday evenings. Uh, it was particularly bad on this day. But traffic is a big issue in California. In fact, uh, two out of five of the most congested regions in the country are in California, and the magnitude of the problem in California, of, of, those, of those regions, is much worse than in many of the other areas that are on the top ten. Time and time again, we have surveys that show that traffic congestion is the number one quality of life issue for Californians, and it is the number one challenge to the continued vitality of our economy. And this is important not only in California, it's important nationally because California is the largest state economy in the United States and it's the sixth largest economy in the world. So the, the, the big trends that are going on in California, the question that's put to me is what would a group of transportation professionals want to know about California that's unusual or interesting? One of the most interesting things about California is our uh, willingness to take matters into our own hands and to solve problems like this at a local level. 
Um, we're, we, we, Californians have a history of, of not waiting for the federal or the state government to, to step in. They take action at the local level. And that often means an endless willingness on the part of citizens to tax themselves to do that, to solve these issues on our own terms. Part of this, I think, is a recognition of how important congestion management is to our quality of life and our, and our economy. The other part, I think, is just pure frustration with sitting for hours and hours and hours in traffic and the promise that perhaps we can make, uh, make something good come from. California leads the country uh, in the concept of self-help, which is passing local tax measures to solve transportation problems in local communities. And um, uh, in California, uh, because of a, of a law that was passed back in the 1970s called Proposition 13, it is almost impossible to raise property taxes. And property taxes in California are very, very low compared <coughs> to the rest of the country. So this almost always takes the form of a local sales tax measure. Today, 24 out of the 58 counties in California, representing 88% of California's population, which incidentally is 12% of the entire population of the U.S. in those 24 counties, um, have voted themselves property taxes in addition to the state's base tax rate of 7 and quarter percent they have voted additional taxes on themselves to solve local transportation issues. Those, together, those 24 counties are going to raise $194 billion by 2050. So it's a significant sum of money involved there. One of the interesting things about, about uh, uh, raising taxes in California is, you know, conventional wisdom is that you can never get two-thirds of anybody to do, to agree on anything. And in California, in order to raise taxes, it takes a two-thirds supermajority. And as you'll see in just a second, time and time again, Californians have voted more than two-thirds to tax themselves to solve their transportation issues. A prime example of this is Los Angeles County, which has a 40-year history of raising sales taxes within the county for transportation problems. 10.7 million people in Los Angeles County. Starting as far back as 1980, Los Angeles County residents voted themselves a half percent incremental extra sales tax for transportation related purposes. Then again in 1990 and in 2008, another half percent. And finally in 2016, <coughs> an additional half percent sales tax. Measure M that passed in, in 2016 is interesting for a couple of reasons, one of which is 71% of voters voted to increase their sales tax in Los Angeles County to, to pay for transportation improvements. No expiration date. Almost all tax measures in California have an expiration date. Measure M has no expiration date. The voters will have to go back to the polls to end it. It'll raise about $120 billion over the next 40 years for transit uh, improvements across all modes. So the sales tax now in Los Angeles County is nine and a quarter percent. That's two and a half percent above the state, uh, or, I'm sorry, two percent above the state's base sales tax rate. Further north in the San Francisco Bay Area, made up of nine counties, most of these counties, I think eight of the nine, are self-help counties. So they already have an incremental extra sales tax to support transportation measures. But as a region, the nine Bay Area counties have banded together and have voted to raise funding for transportation projects through surcharges on bridge tolls. In 1988, through RM1, they raised bridge tolls by a dollar on top of the base tolls that were in place at the time. In 2004, another dollar, and there's a measure that is going to be on the ballot in November of 2018 that's scheduled to raise bridge tolls by three dollars, and that is increment that's raised incrementally over 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 a number of years. But this will raise 4.6 billion dollars over 40 years. These regional measures are interesting for a couple of reasons. One of which is that the money is used to fund transportation projects throughout the nine Bay Area counties, having nothing to do really with transit projects, airport projects, any number of things. 
Um, I'm sorry, they're all surface transportation, but um, service transportation projects across the nine Bay Area counties, but only about 25% of the people are actually using the bridge and paying those. So there's an interesting idea there that you, that you penalize the, the, the single occupant drivers on the bridges in order to pay for these, uh, for these transportation improvements um, because carpools on the bridges get free toll or get reduced rate tolls on some of the bridges. The other thing that's interesting about these regional measures is that because they are not a sales tax increase, they only require a simple majority of the nine Bay Area counties that are voting in order to pass. And the polling right now suggests that uh, that measure RM3, Regional Measure 3 in 2018, will pass. I would point out that the Golden Gate Bridge is not included in that because the Golden Gate Bridge since 1973 has been using excess bridge tolls to subsidize transit for the North Bay counties of Marin and Sonoma. And this brings us to what I consider to be kind of the granddaddy of them all, Senate Bill 1, which was passed in April of 2017. Senate Bill 1 increases the gas tax in California by 12 cents, and this went into effect January 1st. Increases gas taxes by 12 cents, increases diesel tax by 25 cents, increases vehicle registration fees somewhere between uh, 25 and $175, depending on the value of the vehicle. It'll raise about $54 billion over the next 10 years, and that money will be split 50-50 between the state and the local metropolitan areas for the transportation projects that they determine are most beneficial in their, in their own regions. Another interesting thing about Senate Bill 1 is it's indexed to inflation. So starting in 2019, it is indexed to the Consumer Price Index. So we will see gas taxes increase. We will see vehicle license fees increasing uh, index to inflation. The total state gas tax in California, which puts us near the top, but I don't think we're quite at the top, is now 30 cents in pure gas tax. But the total tax burden on a gallon of gas now in California is 86.83 cents per gallon. The initial uh, so so the, the, the graph on the right shows that the initial effect of, of SB1, as intended, was to catch us up for the inflation that has occurred since 1995, which was the last time that the gas tax was increased. And then starting in 2019, the indexing by inflation will keep us even with that inflation curve so that the gas tax revenue that we, that we bring in in California will not be eroded by inflation going forward. Now just to say, or just to, to let you know, all is not uh, goodness and light in California all the time. And there is a bit of a backlash against, uh, against these higher taxes. Um, a measure has been, a, a, a proposition has gotten enough, uh, enough uh, signatures to be placed on the ballot in November where the California voters will go to the polls and vote whether or not to repeal Senate Bill 1 which for those of us in the transportation industry would be a huge, huge step backwards. Uh, and the polling right now suggests that, that the repeal is unlikely to pass, but it is certainly something of, of serious concern and something that we are going to be, uh, that we're going to be keeping a very close eye on. Now, as I mentioned, Senate Bill 1 catches up for the erosion of inflation since 1995 and then, and then tracks with inflation going forward. But at the same time, the governor of California has issued an executive order calling for 4.2 million electric vehicles to be on the road by 2030. And just the continued uh, uh, prevalence of, of hybrid vehicles, which get HOV lane access in California, and just the increasing fuel economy of cars in the, in the corporate fleets, uh, we know that far fewer gallons of gas are going to be sold. And so at the same time as all of this, California is also actively pursuing road user charging. And in fact, in March of 2017, California concluded the largest road user charging pilot program that has been conducted to date. It took place over about nine months, involved 5,000 vehicles that drove 37 million miles. And the state tested six different mileage reporting methods. Uh, and the results were kind of interesting. 
one of the more interesting results for me was that 67% of the people that enrolled in this program chose location-based, GPS-based mileage reporting, despite California's <laughs> absolutely paranoid uh, obsession with privacy. And I thought that was just very interesting. But 73% of the people who participated in that program felt that it was an equitable way to collect uh, uh, road taxes uh, compared to, to compared to fuel taxes. And there was an 85% overall satisfaction with road user charging among the 5,000 people who participated in that study. The next steps that are underway right now are looking at uh, pay at the pump and vehicle telematics as ways of reporting mileage and recording mileage, and an interstate pilot of road user charging. Uh, as you may know, the state of Oregon completed a road user charging pilot and actually has an operational road user charging program running right now. And California and Oregon are currently engaged in a study about what it looks like when two adjacent states are both running road user charging programs um, simultaneously with different rules in the different states. And uh, um, that program, that, that project is just, getting, uh, is just getting underway, so you can expect to see some things come out of that in the near future. Well, California is, so we've, we've, we've looked at, at sales tax, we've looked at gas tax, We've looked at uh, uh, road user charging, and we've looked at toll sur surcharges. Um, let's take a quick look at tolling. Now, California is the land of freeways, and in California, freeways is taken to mean literally free, meaning you don't have to pay to drive on it. And so we did not grow up in California with tolls, like many of you on the East Coast did. Tolls have, have, have not been prevalent in California. We've had tolls on our toll bridges in the San Francisco Bay Area and one in the, in, the, in the Los Angeles area recently since the 1930s. But toll roads were not present in California until the 1990s. As you may know, the first express lane in the, in the world was in California. It was in Orange County, the, the uh, SR-91 express lanes, and that opened in, in, in 1995. It really led a surge of interest in express lanes, especially in California, particularly over the last five years. So just a look at tolling in California today. There are 22 operational toll facilities in California. There are eight bridges that are toll bridges, all of them in the San Francisco Bay Area. There are nine express lane projects currently operating in California. And there are five con conventional toll roads <coughs> operating in California. There are an additional 25 toll projects that are in the various planning stages in different parts of the state. 19 of those 25 planned toll projects in California are express lane projects. So express lanes definitely are a growth industry in California. There are currently 12 agencies collecting tolls in California. Uh, uh, we operate under the umbrella of an organization called CTOC, the California Toll Operators Committee, which is, uh, was formed in the, in the late 1990s um, and really is, is, is not nearly the body that Team Florida has become, and that's one of the reasons I'm here, is to see if there's the potential for building CTOC into something bigger and better, and certainly uh, uh, Team Florida is a, is a prime example of that. A couple of things I do want to mention on the technology front that are happening in California under the auspices of CTOG. Uh, first of all, by January of 2019, all toll agencies in California will be required to read the 6C protocol. And then by 2021, we will phase out completely the existing California Title 21 uh, uh, toll collection protocol which is a good thing because California is the only state using Title 21, and it really is, there's no, the, the, the competitive advantage of going with a modern and broadly accepted um, RFID protocol is, uh, the, the, the advantages of that are obvious both in terms of cost. The other thing it does is all of our neighbors on the West Coast are using the 6C protocol, and so it really sets the stage for regional interoperability, which then sets the stage eventually 
for the formation of a West Coast hub that can join into any scheme um, for national toll interoperability. So we're excited to, to see ourselves finally moving into the modern age with regard to electronic toll collection. The second interesting technological uh, uh, um, development is that the Bay Area Toll Authority, which is, I believe, in revenues, the second largest toll authority in the country, um, maybe third, um, put out an RFP earlier this year looking at a dramatic change in the way they handle their back office. And what they're doing is they're going to be conducting a pilot study where the database, the customer database for their um, electronic toll collection, their back office operation, exists on the Salesforce platform, which is an open architecture uh, uh, platform that any number, thousands and thousands of developers can tap into and develop customized applications. And the, the difference there is, and the promise there perhaps, is that the agency owns the database. And the database is in the format that is open to any developer to come along and to develop customized applications that serve individual customers. So the possibility there is that it will give customers tremendous choice in the way they interact and the way they pay their tolls. Uh, and it will give you know, developers opportunities to, to develop new applications that we haven't even thought of yet. I think it really opens the door to kind of um, um, mobility accounts that go across modes of transit um, and perhaps even uh, leading us into the mobility as a service kind of arena. And so that, that project is just getting underway and we'll certainly be watching that uh, very, very, very carefully. So to sum up, uh, um, as you can see in this picture, this is this is sunrise on uh, I think this might I don't know what, this might be I four hundred five or I five near downtown Los Angeles, and uh, the sun is shining on transportation in California, but as the same picture about nine hours later shows, um, it's going to take a while and congestion isn't going to go away anytime soon. So with that, uh, I thank you for your attention.